fairs that we've done with the, the Temple University Collaborative on Community Inclusion. I wanted to take a quick minute to introduce ourselves. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Gretchen Sneven. I am the Assistant Director for the Temple University Collaborative on Community Inclusion. And a lot of my research within the center focuses on promoting independent participation in community-based recreation, um, but we're also interested in how engaging in the community can increase physical activity um, as well. And, and so we've hosted two activity fairs over the past academic year, um, and, and we're really excited to sh sort of share those experiences with you um, and also to talk about strategies that, that you might use in hosting your own activity fairs. Um, I want to introduce uh, Brandon Sneed and Paige O'Sullivan, and I'm going to give them a brief moment to just tell you who they are. Hi, I'm Brandon Sneed. I am a CTRS, and I work directly with people who have severe mental illness diagnoses. Um, a CTRS is a certified recreation, certified therapeutic recreation specialist, and I work with people to improve their health and wellness using their recreation and leisure interests. Uh, my name is Paige O'Sullivan. I'm also a recreation therapist, and I'm currently working on the support education interventionist here at the Collaborative, where I help college students. All right, um, so that's, that's our team, um, and Brandon and Paige are involved in this webinar specifically because they have um, intimate experience in helping coordinate and run our activity fairs. Um, and so a lot of the questions that you might have about logistics, um, how, you, how it was coordinated, how, um, how the actual event ran, um, they're going to be great resources to help answer those questions. Um, and again, as Katie said, please feel free to ask questions um, uh, directly to her. You can type them in the chat box and we'll be sure to um, answer them at the, at the end. Um, and then we will also be sending you the PowerPoint for this and the, 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 the I'm sorry, webinar is being recorded so we can, um, you can revisit it at the end of it as well. Okay, um, another thing to reference is that this, um, this manual here, Organizing a Physical Activity Fair, a lot of what we reference, um, if you go directly to that manual, um, you can find a lot of the resources that are in there. And so we've developed this physical activity fair, and while a lot of the information is specific to physical activity, um, we do think that um, you can use this if you are interested in hosting a more general fair that was focused on accessing community resources. And again, while we talk specifically about recreation and leisure activities, um, these types of events could be very useful for other types of, of community resources that people might be interested in. Um, and so what we're going to talk about today is really what the benefits and, of hosting an activity fair might be, so why you might actually do it, um, and then go through some of those planning steps that, um, that you might want to do in order to um, plan your fair for success. Okay, so in our experience, we had we had two fairs we hosted, um, and the reason why we decided to host physical activity fairs and activity fairs were to introduce people with severe mental illness diagnoses to things that they could do in their community. So we took into account their, you know, in general, there are a lot of issues that prevent people from being active, and knowledge of resources is one of them. So we wanted to introduce people to things that they could do, and we wanted to take into account things that we've seen in our population of people that we work with, and these include um, issues with transportation, issues with finances. So we looked at things that they could do throughout the city of Philadelphia and centrally located areas within Center City. And we also looked at things that were free and low cost. Um, the people that we work with in general are often um, sedentary, isolated, and these are things that they could use recreation to help them get out of the house, get moving, increase their physical activity levels, and therefore their health outcomes. Um, so we invited people like the Parks and Rec Department, 
um, Indigo Bike Share, the YMCA, and they led sessions. Um, they led yoga sessions, Zumba sessions, dance sessions. They basically got up and got people moving. This was an opportunity for people to maybe increase their confidence and confidence in areas of physical activity. They knew they could do it once they did it with us. They now knew some exercises that maybe they could do at home. They were introduced to um, organizations that would facilitate these types of activities as well. And um, so the first fair that we hosted was specific to physical activity. And the second fair that we hosted was to just community-based um, opportunities for engagement in recreation. Um, and so in the second one, we invited other organizations like the Philadelphia Library. Um, and we, sorry, and we hosted about 150 guests at the fairs and they were, they came from about 10 different agencies. One of the other things that's actually really important for us is because we can actually tell um, people about these activities that happen throughout the city. We can show them where they're at. We can um, provide the resources and the information, but it's a lot of information that's coming specifically from us. Whereas these physical activity or these event fairs are a an opportunity for um, community providers, so the YMCA, Parks and Recreation, um, to be a face and to actually interface directly with consumers. And so it's one thing for us to say, hey, there's all these great things, but it's another thing for, for people to ask questions directly to those service providers. Um, and so we can be seen as, as really more just linking and then helping encourage people to actually go out and, and access the resources that they've met people from. And so while it seems like, well, we could do this easier, we could do this without um, going through and hosting the full fair, um, we actually believe that this is an opportunity to make those connections and to really make sure that those things, um, people are more likely to follow through when they, they see the actual agencies and they engage and they get excited um, through that engagement, not just through us telling them about things. Uh, so again, this is sort of a summary. This may look really familiar. Um, we've all talked about the domains of wellness. We're likely familiar with them if, if you work in mental health. Um, but again, this is one of the things that we really aim to do um, throughout these types of fairs and events. Um, we really want to help peak client interest. Some of the things when we've worked with individuals, we've found that, that consumers sometimes aren't always aware of the things that they're interested in. Um, and so, you know, providing an, a large opportunity or a lot of different resources, um, people are able to say, oh, that looks really interesting, or oh, I'd like to try that, or I haven't ridden a bike in 15 years, you know, maybe that's something I'd, I'd want to try again. And by providing those opportunities and connecting to consumer interests, we're hoping to tap into some of that intrinsic motivation so that people are, are more interested in following through and then participating independently. Uh, obviously, the physical activity fair has some connections to the physical domains of wellness, um, but we also know that people who are engaged in personally meaningful activities um, benefit their emotional wellness. They're also, they're triggering different parts of their brain, so they're more cognitively engaged. A lot of activities that happen out in the community and the fairs themselves are very social. Um, and so there's opportunities for increasing that social wellness. And then when people participate in things that they find personally meaningful, they're able to express their identity in different ways. And so by helping people connect to those resources, you're giving them opportunities to really express meaning and find meaning in those things that they do, express their identity um, through activities. Um, and we talk about spirituality, not just in the religious sense, but really in that, that holistic engagement um, and, and identity of self and that sort of thing. So we're really hitting multiple domains um, that, that people can start, start to tap into through these types of events. And, and, and so that's kind of the benefit or, or sort of our drive behind why we want to help connect consumers to these types of resources. But there are other benefits to hosting these types of events. Um, again, the, the, the top, the top um, bullet point here really talks about 
introducing consumers, providers, and businesses to each other. Um, we want to make sure that, that consumers are aware of the resources that are out there. We also want to make sure that providers, uh, mental health providers, are aware of the different opportunities that are available in the community. It's helpful to, for providers to see consumers engaging with these organizations, community-based organizations, so they can see where um, consumers are drawn to, so that th those might be areas that they then know how to support or they can help support them after the fact. Um, we also know that by, by providing opportunities and giving people the choice, um, we're focusing on interests. We're focusing on things that um, people may want to engage in instead of focusing specifically on diagnoses um, or focusing on symptom management. We're trying to get people thinking about the things that they want to do. Um, by also providing opportunities for community organizations to interface directly with consumers, um, we're helping to de decrease some of those negative attitudes and fear um, that may exist in, in some of the community perceptions. And so by, by providing an opportunity where consumers are asking questions or engaging in activities, we really have the opportunity to decrease some of those negative attitudes that are out there. Um, it's also a really great opportunity to just encourage community-based recreation participation. Um, we can, as providers, we can offer these activities, um, but the problem with that is, is when a group ends, then you know there's no guarantee that people will consumers will continue to participate outside of, of that six week group. Um, and so we're using this as an opportunity to introduce folks to outside um, organization, outside existing opportunities, um, raising awareness that these things can go on independently and you don't necessarily need the mental health center to offer the event in order to participate in, in fun and um, enjoyable activities. Um, and we also use this as an opportunity in some of the, the literature that we send um, the organi organizations that we invite to participate. Um, we talk about, you know, the need to create welcoming environments, um, talk about sending communication directly to mental health agencies so that everyone is aware of the opportunities in their community. Um, and we also um, use this as a way to open lines of communication between organizations um, such as Parks and Rec, YMCA, libraries, um, where they may have staff that are concerned about interacting with individuals who have mental illness. And so we can open up those lines of communication, really try to reduce some of that anxiety um, and help create more welcoming environments. And what we found is that organizations um, are really interested. They just don't necessarily know how to make those connections. They're not sure how to um, be the most accommodating. A lot of times what they think is best is to come into the mental health agency and offer specialized programming, when really it's, it's better for them to just be welcoming and open um, to people participating independently, just like everyone else. Okay, so now we're gonna gonna get into the event committee and what that is a part, like what is a part of that. So there's seven major parts of this that we actually cut up, but these could really be done by multiple people, one person could do each one. So we just wanted to break it down to each role. The event coordinator is really the overseer of this whole entire thing. They need to um, make sure that they're checking in with the schedule, the point person on the schedule, as well as the volunteers, and making sure everything's going well. This is the person that if there's any issues that arise, you kind of send uh, that person to. The presenter manager is someone who really makes sure that the presenters understand the mission of the program. This person is going to be doing the outreach to the presenters, as well as coordinating the time slots and what activities are going to go where. This can also be a role where you are focusing on the setup of the room and how where everything is going to go to make sure that the time slots coordinate with it. The attendee manager is someone who is going to reach out to the specific organizations uh, that the attendees are going to. So for instance, for us, we did mental health organizations. And we made sure that we sent out waivers. So the attendee manager sent out waivers to each of these programs so they could bring them in signed from their participants to registration to make that flow a little easier. And I'll get into that in a second. They, this attendee
attendee manager, manager also recruited guests, made sure that the registration project process went smoothly, was the welcome person, also in charge of handling parking passes for us since we're in a city that was pretty important, as well as being the point person for any of those attendee issues. The marketing manager was is someone who's going to reach out to news, radio, and focus on social media portion of this. So we did live tweeting and Facebook throughout this event. And the marketing manager is someone that's going to handle that and be the point person if there is going to be local news or radio participating in this. The donations manager is going to be someone who is finding donations, making sure they're aligned with the mission of the event. So for instance, you're not going to have candy bars at a physical activity fair. We, we really had just snacks um, that were healthy snacks to do, apples and granola bars. So these were aligned with our mission, of course. This is also the person that's going to send the tax form to all of these donations so that they, it's a nonprofit organization. Facility staff, for this point, we had Temple facility staff come in and make sure everything was set up. The event coordinator can be a part of this to make sure the room is set up as well as the pre presenter manager. And the volunteer manager is the point person for volunteers, the one that does outreach, the one that recruits and makes answers any questions and handles the training of the volunteers. And I will get into volunteers now. So volunteers, we made sure that we identified and recruited volunteers. So for us, we targeted Temple University College of Public Health, specifically students, specifically recreation therapy students, because they understand our mission and would really um, be easier to train. Volunteer roles, these included the registration. So like I just said, we had two registration tables. We had one registration table that was um, focused on people that already pre-registration, already had their waiver filled out. All they had to do is sign in. And then we had another registration table that was for people that needed to register. Because we had such organizations with large groups, this really helped it go smoothly. But we had a welcome team, so people that made, made their attendees feel welcome and asked any, answered any questions. Uh, administrative volunteers, so this is something we added the second time around, where they started filling in attendee information in a laptop, so it made our lives easier after the event. We already had all of the attendees' names, email addresses, and contact information so that we could reach out for further fares. <clears throat> the leisure interest survey, as you see in this picture, we had students fill, students fill out the leisure, or students ask about clients' leisure interests and what they like to do for fun. We're going to get more in depth into that, but this was, we made sure we trained these individuals on how to use the leisure interest form and what forms we were going to give them based on their results. This is a really important part. And because we did the first fair with leisure interest, the second fair we had way more involvement in the leisure interest surveys because we centrally located it and made prizes go along with it. So once you filled out a leisure interest survey, you got a pedometer. So it also aligned with our mission. <clears throat> the volunteers also acted as presenter support, support for the actual client. So getting people up and moving if trying to engage people on the outskirts maybe, and parking. So making sure people knew where to park and where to go for um, directions to the fair. To outreach this, we actually used Google Forms, which is a part of Google Drive. And it allowed us to have a simple spreadsheet once people signed up. We made sure we had a confirmation of the sign up, a follow up email make a week or two before the event saying if they are still interested, and a schedule. So I sent out a schedule prior to the event with what, what was going on, what they needed to wear, what they needed to bring. So everyone had their questions answered prior to the events and felt really connected. Throughout the whole event, we monitored these individuals. We made sure everyone was doing the leisure interest survey, getting people moving, 
and was always there for questions. That was the volunteer manager's thing. And also a lot of our volunteers were required to, to get hours. So this was something that was meeting a need for coursework as well. Um, and sometimes volunteers are, are, are completing volunteer work um, not just because they're intrinsically motivated, but also because they, you know, need to get those volunteer hours for different things. And so part of that monitoring was to make sure that um, volunteers had any sort of documentation that they may have needed to take back to um, teachers or whomever it might be. So, so some of that monitoring is just to track that they actually did it and sign it. Right. And then thanking is really important when you have so many volunteers. We made sure that we get had a physical activity group specific for volunteers that participated where they could do a, I, I think it was a, some sort of circuit at the end, which was a real nice thank you to them. Yeah, car, it was Dex, Dex against, Dex, 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 Dex conspiracy. Dex conspiracy. <laughs> My cards against humanity. All right, thank you. <laughs> So Paige laid out a lot of um, roles that people would have. And like she said, these don't have to specifically all be defined. These roles don't have to be defined by specific people. Different people can do the different things, the different tasks that are necessary throughout planning and executing your event. Um, and these roles are all laid out in the manual that we have on our website. And on the first um, PowerPoint slide here, you can find the link to our manual. All right, so now that you've got your team in place, you've got your committee ready to go, one of the first things you're going to want to do in getting ready to host your fair is to create a mission. The mission is going to act as a guide for how you're, for everything you're going to do within your fair. Um, you want your mission to define the purpose of your event. You want people to read it and get a really clear understanding of what they're coming for. Um, you want it to be quick and to the point. You don't want it to be, to be too lengthy because you do want people to see it, digest it, and understand right away. And again, this is going to drive everything you do throughout the event. So like Paige said just recently, she said that we didn't have, you know, candy bars at our event because that was not something that would encourage physical activity. Um, we had what we had were healthy foods. That that was something that was went right back to our mission to um, you know educate, entertain, and inspire people to get moving. So everything we did was based on education, entertainment, and inspiring people to live a healthier lifestyle, not just for the day while they were with us, but once they left. We wanted them to leave with information, knowledge. And an inspiration to just get out there and enjoy their communities and improve their health and wellness. So, the, our, so our mission was to educate, entertain, inspire people to get moving. And the next few slides, we're going to talk about how we did that. So these are our objectives. Um, objectives you want to lay out to help you um, reach your mission that you've set for yourself. Um, what we did was we had lectures, activities, information tables. Um, these were the heart of what people came and did at our event. Um, our lectures, um, they composed of, you know, the YMCA did a lecture on the benefits of physical activity. Gretchen did a lecture on, um, Gretchen from the Collaborative, who's talking with us today, <laughs> did a lecture on um, using your community. Do you remember? Yeah, it was, it was really using your community to be more active and, and not just talking about like, oh, physical activity is important. That was part of it. But talking about how it doesn't just have to be going to the gym. You know, you can walk walking to the river um, because there's a, a fair there is getting physical activity. Um, Walking your dog is getting physical activity. Um, getting out and doing yoga at the pier. So it was really helping people to think more diversely about how their community can be used to increase physical activity. Yeah, and in addition, we also had Indigo Bike Share came, and they didn't just talk about signing up for Indigo Bike Share, but they talked about safe biking and the benefits of biking, not just your physical health benefits, but it could be fun. It could be an easy way to get around your community. Um, it's a free way to get around your community. Once you have a bike, you don't have to pay for a public transportation to and from places. So we, we really tried to like incorporate a lot of different benefits into the activities that we were discussing in our lectures. 
Um, so we provided that leisure education and we provided tips on how to find and use community resources. The activities that we led, they were activities that were, you know, right for the participants who came in. So we were trying to meet them at their at their level of at a level that was appropriate for their for their skills. Yeah. Um, so we were looking to increase their knowledge of exercises and the, to increase their confidence and competence of being active in groups. So we wanted to make sure that once they were active with us, they felt a little more confident that they could go out and do it in the community. So we had different levels of um, physical activity. So there was a little bit higher, a little bit lower. We also had people walking around acting as aides within each group. So there was a group leader, and then there were several people walking around the group helping people so that they could get one-on-one -on -one support as they needed it. And that one of the really cool things that happened during the event is, you know, it, it wasn't when these activities happened, it wasn't just like sitting back and waiting for the participants to have engaged. We were all engaged. And so even from, from the coordinators of the event to um, I was engaged, so we've got, we've got people who are con sometimes considered these upper level professionals that might be too busy to do these types of things. Um, we, had, we invited people who might have been um, uh, personing the tables at the time. So we really tried to get everyone out and engaged in the activities. So one, there's a couple things that are important to that. It demonstrates to the consumers that, oh, everyone is doing this. This is going to encourage me to do it. And it's also not a fishbowl. Like we're not trying to create an environment where everyone who's attending the event to like share information is standing around watching um, participants um, engage in these activities. We wanted providers, we wanted consumers, we wanted um, collaborative staff, we wanted student volunteers, we wanted people from the library, anybody that wanted to um, come and participate. And, and when people were not, you know, as bold or ready to participate, we made sure that there were other people who were engaged in the activity so they didn't have to feel shy about it. Yeah, and in addition to that, I think it made it a lot more fun for everybody. I think it raised the energy of the whole room to have everybody jumping in and, you know, having fun. Because these things, we, the intention, don't forget, part of our um, mission statement was to entertain. We wanted this to be fun. We wanted people to walk away and say yoga was fun, dance was fun, um, Zumba was fun, so that they might be intrinsically motivated to do that once they left our fair. And, and sometimes the fun seems like it's an unimportant thing, but um, we are a recreational therapist by profession. And part of the fun is very intentional because when people enjoy activities, they're more likely to hold on to those memories. Um, and they're also going to be more likely to engage in it in the future. So if I sat around and watched people have maybe not such a good time doing yoga, I'm probably not going to want to say, mm, that's something I want to try in the future. Or if there's if if people are too um, concerned or or self conscious not to laugh when they and sometimes I fall down when I do yoga <laughs> and I'm totally okay with that. But seeing people um, naturally participating who maybe aren't as high skilled as the people leading it, um, it really helps decrease some of the anxiety about participation. Um, so having fun, laughing. It's really the environment that we wanted to create so that afterwards people are like, oh, I want to do that again. I want to recreate that experience. Yeah, and some of the feedback that we got from the mental health agencies is that people left this fair, went back, and their energy levels were through the roof. So that was really good feedback to help us know that we were reaching our mission. Um, another part of the fair were information tables, and these were just tables that were set up you know, by the YMCA, the public library, Parks and Rec Department, many other agencies where people could just get information. Um, they could sign up for membership. They could sign up for scholarships. They could get more information about these things and how they can do them. So, um, and the information tables, the participants were also incredibly welcome to participate in different activities that we were providing throughout the fair. So, again, like I think the energy levels were really impacted by that. Paige had mentioned earlier that we had leisure interest surveys that we set up for our guests to complete. And we had recreation therapy students leading people through these surveys. And these surveys quickly defined were just um, opportunities for guests to consider what they might like to do out in their communities. And then the 
the students who were facilitating the interviews, the surveys would direct the guests to direct the guests to places where they could do these things and help them decide next steps to participation. And sometimes that was talk to my case manager, look at these things online, or go over and talk to the Parks and Rec Department, maybe for somebody who was interested in basketball. Talk to the Parks and Rec Department about where there may be basketball hoops in their neighborhood. Again, all of these things you can you can find out more about in our manual. Um, more objectives were um, session and event evaluations. So we did, we created these evaluations, which were really quick surveys, just to ask people, how did you enjoy each session? How did you enjoy the overall event? What did you learn from it? Do you think this will inform you, your future participation and activities? We were basically just checking the effectiveness of the fair. Uh, media coverage. This is really important because we wanted to increase the awareness of our mission to get people more active in their communities beyond just the attendees who came for the day. Snacks, again, we're going back to the candy bars. I feel like <laughs> this has been a main theme. Now I want a candy bar. Um, but in general, you want your you want even the food to um, incur to be part of your planning. So if people are hungry, they're going to lose energy. They're going to be focused on wanting to eat instead of wanting to do yoga. Um, this is also an opportunity to encourage healthy eating and talk about how it can encourage an active lifestyle. And honestly, from our first event, we didn't really have. Um, I think we had some water available, but we didn't have snacks available. And people wanted it, and they expected it, and so um, they were leaving the event to go find things around campus and so that they could meet that need. So in our second event, you know, we didn't have a lot. We didn't have, like, full tables, but we did have, um, we handed out some bags for the event that had apples some fruit and some, I think, pretzels um, and some things that people could have um, and not leave to go get something else. Yeah. We know food motivates people sometimes. <laughs> it motivates me sometimes. Um, and finally, um, the handouts that we created. For every activity that people came and led and every educational session that people came to lead, we wanted to make sure that there was a handout available so that they could take information with them. So the yoga, the person who came and led yoga activities, she, went, she gave out a handout that had different poses that people could do anywhere. Um, the um, information that Gretchen led about using your community. We created a community resource, a resource of community based or community like websites and places that people could go to find things that are happening in their communities. And we also had some handouts. Um, I don't know that handouts are the right word exactly, but we did send information that I guess could be printed and handed out. Mm -hmm. uh, but we sent information directly to. Uh, the organizations that came as well, because we wanted them to remember the event. We wanted them to, when they're thinking about marketing their activities, we wanted them to think about marketing directly to um, mental health agencies and to be more inclusive. And so that was important for us as well to sort of continue um, engagement beyond the actual event. And we also gave out the other handouts that we gave were gifts that were donated to us. And these gifts were even focused on encouraging physical activity. They were pedometers and water bottles, um, things like that, that we um, encourage people to consider their healthy lifestyles as they use them. Um, beyond things that were directly connected to our mission, um, as an agency and as the Collaborative on Community Inclusion, we had um, some interests as well that we wanted to achieve from this type of event. Um, so one of the things, and this, this is something that as you're planning your own event, you can start to think about well, what are our internal goals? Like what, are, what other motivations do we have to do this type of event? Um, and one of the things that we wanted to do was to increase contacts, but also maintain some of the contacts that we have. So we are primarily a research and training center, and we do a lot of, um, we have a lot of research studies. We reach out to a lot of mental health um, agencies in the community um, to ask if we can connect with consumers and, and do surveys and all of that. And, and we want this is an opportunity for us to give back to those organizations as well. Um, and so we wanted to increase contact with those agencies, but we wanted to maintain contact. 
Um, and we wanted to be seen um, not just as the people who come in and ask questions, but we wanted to be seen as an organization that um, is available as a resource um, for mental health providers and for um, consumers as well. Uh, we also felt that this is an opportunity for career development. Um, this, these events have been entirely run by our staff um, and by our interns as well. So in the past couple, uh, in the past year, we've had uh, recreational therapy interns come in. And so this gives them the opportunity to um, coordinate and manage an, an event and, and communicate at, on different levels with um, community organizations, mental health providers, um, consumers, um, and we also provided an opportunity for students um, to interface with those same organizations or same groups of people in a different way than just learning about it in the classroom. So it was a way for us to be able to offer an opportunity for career development. Um, while we didn't necessarily look at this as a specific opportunity for revenue, um, other or you may have that opportunity built in, um, particularly if you have any sort of fee associated with attending. Um, this wasn't something that drove us, um, but it is something to consider when you're hosting these types of events. Um, we also, this, you know, we want our name to get out there, and so this was a way for us to offer an event um, and, and news media is more likely to respond to these types of activities than when, say, we get a, a journal article published. And so this was a way for us to um, have some publicity around the issues um, and the benefits of community engagement, those things that are really important to us and drive our mission as a center. This was a way for us to get that information out in a way that is a little more exciting to some of the general public so that they knew who we are and what we do and why we do the things that we do. Um, next, we're going to talk about um, some of the general decisions that you're going to have to make when you're planning your event. Um, the first that we have here on the slide is VIPs and targeted outreach. And this is where you're going to have to decide who are the really important people who you, and groups that you want to participate in the fair. Who's going to be there to make, make it a success? You want to think about the agency. So we got in touch with all of the agencies that we really wanted to be there to make sure that they had um, availability during that time and there weren't other big events within their agencies that were going to keep them from participating. We got in touch with our staff members because the line staff, the people, us who were working on it, we might not know when our board of directors who really want to be there or our CEO is going to be there. And we want to make sure that we're not creating an opportunity that they cannot be involved with and have face that. Um, we also wanted to, we checked in with um, some people who were interested in participating through the mayor's office to make sure that we had um, a date that worked for them. These were important figures that we wanted at the event. We also reached out to some of the people who had participated in the past, like the, when we did the second one, the first one we had the YMCA, we had a couple of yoga groups. We had people who really brought a lot of energy and, um, and excitement to the event. And we wanted to make sure that our second event that they were available for. So we reached out to all of them before we set our date and time. Um, Paige and Gretchen are reminding me that Hooter who is Temple's mascot, and the owl who you've seen in a previous picture on these slides. Um, we, we also made sure Hooter was available because he's a lot of fun. And he actually came and did yoga with us, which made a lot of people happy. He, and he stuck around to take pictures until people were done with him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the next thing you want to think about is the date and time. This is something that's been actually like a challenge for us. We're working with mental health agencies that are bringing a lot of people to these events and they're busing a lot of people to these events. So we really have to take into consideration the dates and times that they are available to come out and participate through their bands. And we need to make sure that um, we're respectful of the other things that they have to do throughout a day. So we had to work with mental health agencies to make sure that this was, that our date and time was possible for them just based on their programming. Uh, the location. So we are lucky. We are at Temple University and we have 
a really centrally easy to reach location with lots of parking. And that's something you want to take into consideration. Think about how people are going to get there, how easy even directions are going to be to get them to the location. Um, think about buses and car parking. Do you have availability for parking? Is it paid parking? These are things that people are going to want to know before they come to the activity. Do you need parking passes? We had to arrange for par having parking passes available for people when they came. And again, trains and buses are, are your guests going to be able to reach you by train or bus. Um, and again, talking about the parking passes, that's something you want to consider is who's getting a parking pass. We didn't charge our um, vendors who came out to advertise, you know, their what's going on in their agencies. So we didn't think of them as the parking pass recipients. We thought the parking pass recipients would be more the guests. Um, sometimes these things, that was a little more fluid, but um, that was definitely the focus was getting guests there. And particularly agencies that might be bringing, you know, 30 or more people. It's, it, one, it's difficult to find parking for large vans like that. So we wanted to make sure that that, that wasn't a deterrent to attending. Uh, the budget and revenue is something you're definitely going to have to think about. Um, we're, again, lucky that we're on Temple campus and we were able to get a space that was pretty inexpensive. Um, but it's something you want to consider. How much are the, do you have to get, what are they, licenses for street fairs or things like that? How much do they cost? And are, do you have opportunities to bring in some money? Do you want to offer food or items that people can buy at your fair? Again, like Gretchen said, this was not a main concern of ours at our fair, but you might want to think about it. You might want to think about at least breaking even for your fair. So it's not a cost deterrent for your agency to put it on again in the future. And the other thing in terms of space, if you don't, um, we're, we're lucky in that we can rent out um, rooms pretty easily and pretty affordably. Um, but the other thing is to partner with different organizations. It doesn't necessarily have to be um, mental health agencies hosting these types of events. It could be YMCA's or it could be a mental health agency connecting with a community organization um, who may have some of those spaces. And that's an opportunity for them to one, feature their space and their resources specifically but it also allows them to um, have something that they can donate if they don't have um, finances that they can donate or they don't necessarily have um, gifts or trinkets or water bottles or those kinds of things that they can donate. But donating space um, can be a huge benefit. And so you can think creatively about how you can meet those needs um, and use your community resources as well. Yeah, these events are definitely a collaboration. And if you can collaborate on everything from from beginning to end, it could save you a lot of time and headaches. Um, and the final thing that we have on this slide is indoors versus outdoors. There are benefits to both. If you're indoors, you're not going to attract walk-by. You're not going to inspire the community to see what's going on and to get moving based on what, is, what they see. Um, if, but if you're outdoors, you know, you risk the rain or cold or whatever the weather may bring. So, in general, you want to um, weigh those pros and cons and make your decisions based on that. Um, legal considerations, I'm not going to go too much into these. Um, they're, you know, important for you to work this out with your team. Um, some of the things that we needed to, again, you can look at all, you can find all of these in the manual and brainstorm them with your committee. Um, in general, we um, needed to really think about, because we were providing physical activity, we wanted to know what is our insurance covering was one of our main focuses. Um, we, we found that our insurance did cover um, our physical activity fair participants. Um, and the other thing that was important was that we had a lot of people around who were who had a certificates in CPR, which we didn't need, thank, thank goodness. But um, in general, um, having people around who could help is, is great. Well, and, and something also with the photo releases, because we were taking pictures that we had intended to share on social media, um, we wanted to make sure that that information was communicated to all of the participants um, because we recognized that we were hosting an event that was inviting um, mental health consumers and agencies. And so we want to make sure that people knew that we were going to be taking um, pictures of the event and sharing it. And also, if people didn't want to have their picture taken, that there was a way that our, our photographer could easily identify those folks. Um, and we had um, 
like a sticker that those folks were able to wear that would sort of indicate that they, they didn't want their photo taken because we didn't want it to be mandatory. So, and again, these are all a summary of the different types of communications that we had. Um, you know, we had, we wanted to make sure that, that the event ran as smoothly as possible. Um, and we also wanted to make sure that it was successful for participants at all levels. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that volunteers and staff knew, you know, what type of clothing they should be wearing um, because it's, it's, you know, it's a physical activity fair, high heeled open toed shoes may not be the best choice. Um, and the same thing for volunteer or for um, participants consumer participants. We wanted to make sure that they knew that this was, yes, an informational fair, but there would be opportunities to get moving um, so that people could come prepared for it. We wanted to make sure that they knew how to get there um, and that they felt confident when they when they left the door, that they knew where they were going, they knew what was going to be offered, um, they knew how long they were going to be there, um, and all of those really logistical types of questions. We wanted to make sure that um, people knew that there was some food available, but that we weren't providing lunch. Um, so that that's something that the the consumer participants and also agency providers needed to be aware of. We wanted to make sure that they knew that it was an accessible facility, that there's an elevator in case they had individuals who might be wheelchair users. Um, we wanted to make sure that there was um, contact information if they had any questions. Um, we wanted to make sure that we had any sort of, if, if people could call on the day of, they weren't calling a phone in an office somewhere, but that they had cell phone numbers so that they could reach us. And so all of these, again, are summarized in that manual, but it's just important to really think through all of the types of communications and the things that you want to make sure people know um, beforehand and when you're planning the event. This is going to be important too when you're writing up all of your communications. So think about these when about including these when you're creating a media release or flyers when you're recruiting people through emails. This is stuff that people are going to want to know. They're going to want to know what they should wear and where it's going to be and if they need to bring their own food. This is all important information. All right, and then once your event is over, it's easy just to be like, oh, we're done. Like, woo. High five. High five. Let's go home. Um, but really make sure you take time to thank everyone. Send thank you letters to the agencies, um, the mental health agencies that brought consumers. If, if you know of consumers that came independently and you have their contact information, follow up with them because that's a really welcoming and engaging um, action and, and something that will help encourage them to come back. Send thank yous to the volunteers who, who um, took time out of their day to come and help make the event happen. Take time to thank internal staff um, that, you know, this is different than the normal day-to-day -day activities. And so make sure that you show appreciation to them. Um, make sure that you share um, any sort of pictures and, and videos. These can be part of that thank you so that they can see themselves having fun and engaging in things. Um, send thank you, thank you um, letters to the community organizations that took time to bring things and host um, activities. And so it's really important to just like share that information and let them know that you really appreciate the opportunity that, that they were there and that they took time out of their day to engage and really um, their participation really made the event successful and their participation really allowed for the mission to be met. Um, and so let them know that they were an integral part of uh, the activity fair. Make sure you add information if you have a website, if you have social media. These are great. Um, these types of events are great for highlighting um, fun things, um, which people like to see more. Um, we Sometimes our day-to-day -day work is maybe not as exciting to, to visually look at, but these types of events are great photo opportunities. They're great um, to promote your mission, your agency, and all of that. So make sure you take the time. It can take time to make those things nice and presentable, but make sure that you take the time to do that because that's going to be um, great, and, and particularly if you're a nonprofit, nonprofit and you have a board, they're going to want to see those things if they weren't able to attend. Um, reach out and, and look for ways to continue collaboration. This was really important to us 
um, because we want to inspire other organizations to do these types of events. We want to, um, if, if the YMCA or if local parks and rec was saying, hey, this is great, we want to make sure that we're um, continuing conversations so that we can continue to include individuals with mental health conditions. Um, we want to make sure that we have something set up to continue those conversations. Um, and, we, and, and as a staff internally, we make sure to have a wrap-up meeting so that we're able to process through what we think went really well um, and those areas that we might need to improve so that, um, like, for example, our first fair, we had folks, um, we didn't, we encouraged people to complete the waiver beforehand, but we didn't stress the importance of it. And so when we had large groups show up, they were there um, standing in a huge line um, to complete these waivers. And it really, it created a, a traffic jam that took away from some of the event because they weren't able to get in quickly. Um, and so that's something that we can make changes for um, our second um, event. And so having that wrap up meeting um, gives everybody the opportunity to talk through what went really well and things that you should change for the future. Okay, um, so that is really the, what we've done in terms of activity fairs. Um, again, we would love to open it up for questions. Um, Katie is helping to coordinate those. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the comment box um, and we will respond to them as they, as they come up. Um, some of the questions that we maybe have had in the past about activity fairs, um, have, have centered around, um, you know, why, why take the time to do these types of events? Um, why not just give people information? Um, and we really think that, that activity fairs are, are kind of an event that are fun to go to, um, and they also are a little bit memorable. And they may spark that interest um, through engagement versus um, just seeing the information on a printed piece of paper or seeing the information on a screen somewhere. Um, and so this, this actual interaction, we, you know, go a little old school um, and not just rely on, on media and technology, um, but we think that those face-to-face -face interactions are important for encouraging participation and raising awareness. We also think that um, some of the questions that we've had have, have been about physical activity because we don't just focus on those high-end energy expenditures. Um, we have focused on really just getting out and being active. Another great benefit of hosting an event like this is offering opportunities for career development. Um, students can do great things. Sorry about that. I think I accidentally muted us. Um, but in in uh, and I, I believe Brandon was talking and you, you may have heard some of it, but really this was an opportunity for career development, both at the student level, um, at our staff level, who uh, maybe haven't had some of the experiences with um, managing these types of events. Um, and so it was, it was a great way to allow for staff to sort of challenge, um, challenge the, and diversify their roles in different ways. So um, to be respectful of time, we've got just a couple minutes left. Um, if you don't have any questions and it doesn't um, look like we've had any so far, we do have our, oops, our contact information here. Um, please feel free to reach out. We're you know, very excited about these types of events. We would love um, to see other organizations hosting them in the future. Um, and so if you do have any questions um, or you're like, oh yes, I wanna do this, please use the manual, look through it, um, reach out to us, let us know that you're doing it and let us know, that, um, let us know if you have any questions about hosting your own events. Um, as a follow-up, we will be sending the PowerPoint um, a link to the uh, physical activity fair resources. Um, and once we get the uh, video transcribed or the, the audio transcribed from today's webinar, we will be sending out um, a copy of the webinar as well. So thank you for taking time to participate today. And I'm gonna pass it back to Katie in case she has any other last comments. Hey, 
Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining us today. I just want to remind everyone that in addition to sending out the, sending out the PowerPoint and the webinar recording information, that you can find a lot of resources, including the manual that was referenced in this webinar, at our website, which is Collaborative. Dot org. So that would be a place to go find a lot more resources and other information about physical activities, issues for people who have serious mental health conditions, and also if you wanted to connect with anyone at our research center, that would be a way to get in touch with them. So thank you everyone for coming out and joining us today. We really appreciate it.